I think it became apparent on our trip to Australia that something was wrong with Gary. We didn't know quite what. He loved Australia, didn't he? Oh, yeah. In New Zealand. We went to New Zealand. We actually went, I went with him once, uh, Gary and I lecturing. And then uh, a year later, Mike and I and Gary went together and we did traveling fly fishing programs both in uh, Australia and New Zealand, plus go fishing. And, and he was, he, but he just loved it, didn't he? Oh, yeah. He just, uh, whenever he was where trout are, he was happy. Yeah, and he loved to talk to the Australians because they loved the books, and yeah. you know, he was very, very popular in Australia. But then I just noticed that he, was, when he was waiting, he was having a little bit of difficulty, and they could tell that something uh, was going on with him. And of course, it wasn't uh, a year and a half later that we discovered that he had ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, devastating disease. Yeah, it's uh, you know, it's it's good in the sense that you're. Your mind is probably even sharper than before, but your your muscle coordination you, you just lose all your muscle strength and coordination, and, and until you you virtually uh, uh, have no freedom anymore. And that's what's tough on a guy to have no freedom. But you know, Gary made the best of it. We never heard him complain at all. He can, you know, he just went on. He he couldn't fish anymore, but he could write about it, and he found a way to be productive. And you know the good thing about Gary he, is he could talk right up to the end. Yeah, that is fortunate. Actually, my uh, wife's mother had the same thing, and it took her life. And the last four or five months, she couldn't communicate at all. She couldn't write, or she couldn't speak. And fortunately, that didn't happen to Gary. In April, Gary died in January. He had a chance to talk, and you're going to hear. Uh, Gary talk to you and give you his thoughts on life and a little bit about living. I think you're really going to enjoy it. This was the last time that Gary was ever on tape and it's a very special to all of us and I hope that you enjoy it. Right outside of the city. Yeah, I, I, fished, I fished Gunpowder Falls many yeah. times. And I uh, caught a fish about this size. I said, well, well, let me get this little fish off and I'll show you how to fish streamers. And they all went, oh, oh, we've never seen a fish that big here. Well, I've seen, I, they, they've seen them that big, but that is a nice, an 18 inch fish can fight like a 28 inch fish. It's a good, healthy fish. That nice coloration. I mean, it's brown, nice fat, like a football. That's what you'd expect. Yep. <laughs> Look at that. You know, this, this river, river in the fall can have fishing just like in New Zealand. Some really great spot fishing where you see the fish rising just before they get ready to come on. Beautiful. Also, in. Uh, Nicely done. That was not, for all our joking, that was not an easy fish. You had to be able to spot him and get your cast right on his nose because he wasn't moving far left or right. Behind his rod. Oh uh, yeah, got him right, got him right where I should have, right in the mouth. <laughs> All right. This time when uh, the fish are feeding on spray, sometimes you can actually do better than you do during the main hatch because there's not so much food out there. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, they, well, your fly's competing with a lot less naturals. Absolutely. You know that. That just makes sense, too. Of course, we've been That's doing what? tips and telling people a lot about what's going on in fly fishing and giving them some good ideas. But right here, I'm looking at a spot which you said was where Gary caught his last fish. And I was with Gary, you know, you know that right after he got this terrible news and couldn't fish, he caught this fish, he still wanted to go out and be around fishermen. And he insisted on doing a television show with me. Now you think about how would you like to be his fly fishing personality and not be able to fish, yet you're going to be on a television show. A pretty tough thing to do, hmm. but you know Gary could handle it. So oh, he what, could handle about anything. So here he was. He could still walk. He couldn't use his hands, just barely. But he was going to do a television. This was the last time he was ever on broadcast television. It was on the Fly Fish uh, magazine show on Outdoor Life Network, and it's down on the Green River. And you'll see Gary. One of the things about it is. It's a, like a play-by-play. -play. You've heard of play-by-play, -play, of course, announcers in athletic events. How about a play-by-play -play in fishing? Mm -hmm. Basically, we put him on a rock, we stuck a camera in the water, 
and followed insects, and Gary did a play-by-play -play about what you, what you were seeing. Yeah, you've shown me that some of that footage. It's pretty interesting. It is interesting. I wasn't there. No. I don't know where I was. I wish I'd have been there. Yeah, I wish you would have been there too. It was turkey time. Oh, well, then I know where I was. was I like the turkey hunt. This is an April on the Green River, and we're going to go there, and we're going to see Gary uh, give me a little grief, as he always did. As, uh, as I'm fishing, he's going to be telling me how I should be doing it, but you're going to learn a lot about it. Then you're also going to go play by play with the insect announcer of the century, Gary LaFontaine. <laughs> well, Gary, we're on the Green River. Probably one of the best early season rivers in the, all of the West or all of America. Well, it's one of the best all season rivers. I don't know if it's any better in the spring than it is in the oh. winter or the summer or any other time. The weather's a little bit nicer now than it is either in the winter or when it's 100 degrees during the summer. It is. You know, it's a funny time. It's April. And most people don't think about throughout the West, especially in the northern part of, the, of America, they don't really think of April being one of the best, if not the best, dry fly month. You get your betas, you get your blue-winged olive. Then near the end of the month, you'll get your granum, your little four-sided case caddis. And uh, they're both spectacular. You know, there's a lot of rivers. The green, of course, in uh, northern Utah, and uh, actually a little bit of it's in, even in Wyoming, right on that corner. It's one of the best uh, spring rivers you can ever imagine. Uh, clear water, stable, doesn't really have a runoff because it comes out of a dam. Tailwater fisheries have really added to uh, our spring fisheries, haven't they? Well, they're so consistent. Like I say, you can fish this any day of the year. If you want to bounce a scud pattern or a San Juan worm along the bottom, you'll do fairly well. If you want to hit the hatches, they're the, uh, this particular stream is not the greatest hatch river in the world, um, so we often use fairly large attractors. And even during this time of the year, you can throw a big, big fly out there and hope that something will come up and smack it. Streamers always work in this river. Streamers will always work, nymphs will always work, so it's a very consistent stream. That, that's going to be, when you get a day uh, like today, it's about 65. Uh, tomorrow it could be 38, yet right. it still be, uh, will be great fishing. Yes, absolutely. It will be, and you can sight fish, whether you're fishing for right. below the surface or up on top. You pick your fish, you approach them, and you try to take them. And you know yeah. what I like about it is you can be alone. <laughs> <laughs> that is, if you can find your own rock. You better bring your own rock. <laughs> <laughs> How are you going to be alone down there, Jackson? <laughs> it's just so many. I mean, there are just so many rivers that are starting into runoff time, and this, is, this secret is no longer a secret people come from all over. This is the busiest guide season for these people, you know that? Right down that spring spring shoot. Yep. Yeah. Spring early season dry fly fishing. Do you have that back east? Absolutely. You got tail waters all through the east. The Farmerton River, my home river, which you've seen. Mm -hmm. You've seen the Farmerton. Um, the Farmerton's a tail water. Uh, the White River in uh, the South Holston and the Jackson all through the Mid-South. Um, great tail water rivers. So yeah, if you want to hit tailwater rivers in the spring when everything else is blown out, definitely this is a spot to be. I know I've had some tremendous fishing uh, uh, in Washington on the Yakima River for early season. Yep. Uh, you fished the Yakima. Many times, yeah. Yeah, love the Yakima. In fact, it's a very similar river to this, too. Uh, not as big. Uh, no, no, but well, this river can be a lot smaller. It's, it's about 3,000 right now. One of the characteristics of the green this time of year is seeing people with fish on. Uh, this is a river where people can catch a lot of fish. Uh, it, there's 12,000 fish per mile in this river, Gary. You know that? Uh, you'd say, well, the problem is if you hit the hatch, if you hit the betis, so that's a fairly small insect. Right. You're looking at uh, really not even 16s, which you may see on many rivers. Here it's more like an 18. And um, they have betas that go down to 24 here, too. That's right. That's right. And uh, different species, different sizes. And you get you get very very tiny tiny insects and uh, yeah they can't match it they can't they can't see the flies they can't set the hook they can't play the fish and other than that they're doing just fine. <laughs> well, it can be a learning experience too. I think uh, beginning anglers do better with fishing in the uh, midge pupa right under the surface. And one of the tricks there is to use obviously a strike indicator because you're not going to see the fly very well. Yeah, that's something that. I really want to talk to during our program, Gary, is uh, our time together with you is to talk about the different ways of strike indication.
We're down here at Little Hole, and this is a place that can be somewhat intimidating for beginning fly fishermen. There's lots and lots of anglers, and we're not more than 20 feet from the landing, and there are fish coming up left and right. The whole area is just blanketed with insects. Gary, what advice would you give a person that comes here the first time? Stop shaking. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've been fishing for a long time, and you have too, and it still gets us excited. There, there, their two heads just popped up. I know. Right. And, and, and you're sitting here talking. There's something yeah. wrong with you, Jackson. I know. I'm a sick person, Gary. Sick man. Uh, I guess as the advice I would get, give us give somebody is to pick out one fish, is to not try to flock shoot. You got to pick out one fish and try to take him instead of just having a cast go left, right, here, there. You know, it's interesting, Gary. We got a blanket of midges on the water, and we've got some uh, blue wing olives. Observation, ooh, there was a nice fish that just came up out there. Observation is the key to fly fishing, and, and right now that I, I've watched some bigger flies go by and, and, and the fish have not taken them. That, that tells me something. It, uh, uh, I've noticed that either they're taking the midges or it could be spinners. We're, we're kind of playing detective, aren't we? They're taken fairly uh, carefully. A few Now there's a few getting a little bit more active. We're seeing a little bit more rolls, a few uh, bigger heads coming up and they could be taking the uh, mayfly duns off the top. You know, there's, there's, uh, no, how do you explain having spinners, which there are insects that have laid their eggs and died, and yet we see the same type of insect emerging right now? Well, let's run through the whole process. You have the nymph that lives on the bottom. The nymph will swim up to the top and break its way through the surface film. The fish could take them at that stage as an emerger. Then you have the dun, the mayfly dun, riding on top of the water, drying its wings. Well, after a day or so, those duns are going to come back. It could be at the same time of day as an egg layer or what we call a mayfly spinner. And so it's a, so it's a remnants of last, yesterday's hatch coming back. Absolutely. And so Absolutely. they coincide. And that presents some problems for the angler. You better decide what they're feeding on. Right. What about when you go to a stream and you don't see anything on the water? Like, we're really blessed here. We know what's happening. Uh, what can uh, walking over and picking up a rock tell us? Tell us that there's a bottom. <laughs> <laughs> what, what can you learn from the insects that are in there? Well, you can learn what kind of insects are there. It can tell you an awful lot about how rich the stream is, um, what the makeup of the stream is. Well, Gary, we've got a lot of choices here. There's insects on the surface. Obviously, there's uh, emergers going up. Uh, it can be confusing for an angler to decide what to choose. How do you make that decision? One fish at a time. That's right. In other words, there could be one fish out there feeding on midges, another one feeding on emergers, and another one feeding on dry flies. You have to watch the fish. You have to read the rise form. I think more than anything is studying an individual fish and then planning an attack on him and going for that. And if you're not successful there, you might try another one, see how successful you are at that. And if, you, then if it's not working, then you've got to change your tactics. Now there's a fish right over there at the edge of the current line between the slow and the fast water. That fish is feeding on emergers. How can I tell? Because of the way he's rolling and really not breaking the surface. But you look downstream, there's a little backwater there, there's fish cruising. You see a little bubble that they're leaving on the surface. Those are taking duns. Yes. You know, one good way is, you know, I, now I have a dry on, but uh, on this kind of a situation, there's no question that I'd put just below it a little emerger. I just sure. wouldn't think of any other way of fishing it but two flies. That way you don't have to change every time you come to a different fish. That's right. You got to realize that when you're studying, trying to find a fish like that, that uh, he may feed 10 times and you're only going to see one time. When he's feeding on emergers like that, he's taking a lot of them underneath the water so you never actually see him break. And then you'll see him break. And then you know you need to use an emerger pattern. 